Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for having me today and for the very kind welcome you have given me here. Um, for those of us who are Catholic, all of us in this room, the Pope has a very special central role in our religious life. Um, and I, I don't know, we are one of the few religions that has a designated head, and I'm sure that's the reason for that. Uh, those of us, of us who are baby boomers have had lived under six popes at this point. And that, um, so it shouldn't be a surprise if I tell you that I am a Catholic and also a portrait painter if I mention to you that I have painted, of those six popes, I have painted the last three. Um, the ones who have had the position for the past 30 year, 40 years since 1978. I want to start by actually showing you what the paintings look like. This is, of course, Jean Paul. This is the portrait of Benedict. And this is the portrait of, of Pope Francis. Now, I think you will look at it, and what you're going to say is, oh, of course, there's a sort of naturalness, inevitability to it. Like, if I'd taken a photograph that looked exactly like that and just copied it, you are going to find that is very far from being the truth. I don't come here today to talk about the popes per se, because there are people far more qualified than I am to talk about that. Rather, I come to use them as a portal for you to enter into my world as an artist so I can share with you some of the issues involved in doing them, uh, the things I need to take into account, and the problems I need to overcome. Now, I started with the idea I wanted to do Pope John Paul. Now, you would think, th there are certain concepts I'm going to explain to you as we go, and one of them is that if I want to find photographs to paint someone famous, I have no sources beyond the sources you have. You would go on the internet, I go on the internet, and all I have is what is on the internet and what I can fine being as resourceful as I can in, in looking. And I don't often find something that's going to satisfy me. Now, in this case, um, I found a photograph that I liked, and I turned it into this painting that you see here. It, it was a painting that emphasized his piety. And that was fine, because he was very sincerely and very deeply pious. And I was not dissatisfied with that painting. But then uh, two, three years passed, and we focused on John Paul a lot when he went into his last illness, and then he died, and there was so much media attention on the days around the funeral. And that really made me think a lot. It made me think how I could talk about John Paul with a certain person in mind, and my children, who are of a different generation, could also talk about him, use the same name, but they had a totally different person in mind. We might as well have used different names. Now, you have to understand what we baby boomers experienced. When John Paul uh, became Pope in 1978, it was like a rock star bursting onto the scene. Um, we had had a series of elderly popes. Suddenly, there was this man who was in his 50s, who was vigorous, he was sharp, he had a great sense of humor, and he became one of the most exciting celebrities in the world. And that is how I experienced him, and how utterly tragic what happened between 1978 and 2005, because which is what younger the millennials remember of him, because this man who was an expert skier couldn't get out of his wheelchair. 
And this man who spoke several languages and was so intelligent could only mumble. And that is what the, how the millennials defined him. I thought that was so tragic, and I wanted to revisit the subject and find something that would let me capture something of what I remembered so vividly. I did not find exactly what I wanted, but I'll tell you what I used. I, and I did something I hate doing, but this was the best I could find. And I did not paint this exactly. I used it as a platform for putting in the, the things that I remembered. The, I wanted to do something that would show how quick he was, how sharp his sense of humor, and that mixed several emotions at once. Because if you want to do a portrait that really, really looks natural, try to find a way that the person will see several emotions in the face. That makes it so human. And this is what I did. You can see the changes. And here is the close-up. This painting hung for several years at the Pope John Paul Cultural Institute in Washington, which is the same thing as what is now the Pope John Paul Shrine. It just changed hands and changed names. A couple of years later, I decided I was going to paint Pope Benedict. And to sort of jump to the end, this is the painting I uh, ultimately did. And I photographed it in the foyer of my house so you can see the scale. I decided very early on that I just wanted a very simple pose against a very simple background. I felt that fit him well. Um, so I found a photograph that would give me the pose of the body I wanted. Now, that photograph, unfortunately, I really wasn't thrilled about the face, but I thought, okay, I can rise above it, I can work with it. Actually, that didn't prove to be the case. And with Benedict, I had a different sort of problem. It wasn't not finding something that would have the emotions I wanted. It was just making it look like him. And I've never before or since had such a problem. I started in the year 2010, and it's a wonderful thing that the photographs we take today have embedded all the information of dates because I can chronicle my struggle with this. And it went through, I'll show you some faces it went through. Not good, not good. This is getting better and I would send them to the same people and, and say, please tell me I've got it now. And they would kindly say, you're not quite there yet. Now, this introduces another thing that artists need to deal with, failure. What do you do when you're trying, it's just not coming out? Well, first you have to decide if it's really worth it. Obviously, this was. And then you have to walk away from it. Maybe you have to get away from it for days, weeks, months, whatever, before you go back to it. Um, during the time I worked on this, I actually painted over the face, just painted a skin color over the face and started over. Two, three times I did that. And it was such a big painting and I loved it other than the face and I, I just kept thinking, I'm gonna get this freaking face no matter how, many, how long it takes me. <laughs> the photographic record tells me that the date came in January of 2013. I think it was a delayed Christmas, New Year's present from life or something. And this is what I had. And I held my breath. I sent it out to my friends. And I said, yay, you got it now. So it took that long for me to get it. <coughs> Today, because of things I would have done differently, it wouldn't have happened. But that was a big struggle I had. Finally, we get to the painting of Francis. Here we have yet a different problem. 
And here the problem is not the figure itself, but developing an appropriate setting to paint around them. The two paintings you just saw don't have a setting to speak of because they just have brown paint, which I thought was best for those two paintings. Most of the time, my paintings do have a specific architectural or landscape setting. And I, I wanted to do that with Pope Francis. Very early on, I found a photograph of him that I really, really liked. I, I looked at it and I said, I, I, that's perfect. There's nothing better. We associate him with, as somebody who, who is such a kind man who exudes joy and love. And this photograph just caught everything I wanted. The only flaw with it was that I couldn't use the background. Um, so I was going to need to come up with another background. Well, I asked myself, now in what sorts of setting would the Pope be greeting crowds? Okay, well, a crowd. Let's try that. So I did try it. And this is what happened. Not good, right? He's standing with his back to the crowd. No, that's not going to work. And you could say, well, she's not being very imaginative. You could put the crowd in front and the Pope behind. No, because then it would be a painting of the crowd, and the Pope would be in the background. He'd be a little figure this big. OK, no. So then I thought, well, that's not going to work. Maybe I can put him in a church. So I tried that. No, that doesn't work either. He, here he is in an empty church saying hi, and you don't even know who he's saying hi to. OK, so neither of those worked. And then at some point, I knew what the perfect solution was. I don't know how it came to me. It was so perfect that I just wondered why it wasn't the first thing that came to my mind. He needed to be in a balcony greeting the crowds. It took care of everything. And of course, if you're talking about the Pope greeting crowds in a balcony, you know what balcony you're talking about, aren't you? The, the ceremonial balcony in St. Peter's Cathedral. So I went back to Google Images. Google Images and I are very good friends. And I found this photograph. And it was high resolution photograph. And I became very excited because I knew I would want to blow it up, blow up details of it that I could only do if it was high resolution. Here, it was cropped. And I used many of the details that you see there. OK, so now at this point, you might think, if I tell you, so that really took care of everything, you might think, well, how is it that took care of everything? She's got a picture with a background she can't use. And she's found a piece of architecture that she can't use. But how do you meld the two together? It's not in the correct angle. It's, you know, how do you incorporate? those two. OK, well, here I have to say it's a matter of being resourceful and of having learned some artistic technique along the way. And what I did, I created St. Peter's of Philadelphia at home, uh, or as much of it as I needed. And half an hour with some cardboard and some scissors and some tape, and look what we had. And you can see that I printed out the French doors of behind the balcony. See that I wanted a high resolution. And I taped it to the back of my balcony. And you're going to say, oh, but how, how can that help you? You don't have a pope. No, don't underestimate me. I did have a book. <laughs> there you go. And if you think that I didn't quite totally catch Francis's liking, likeness, it's OK. We, this is fine for our purpose. 
So what I did was to put him in the balcony and take pictures from every conceivable angle. Now, an aside on that angle, that is, the angles are very important. Having, you don't want in a painting having things just dead front toward you. That takes energy away from your composition. In here, the Pope was going to be fully front toward us because that's the photograph and I couldn't change it. That made it that much more important that the balcony be at an angle. So I took photographs from a number of angles and I decided that this was going to be more, something close to this was going to be what I was going to use. At this point, I did some Photoshop magic and you're about to see that what I've been talking about the last couple of minutes wasn't an exercise in artistic madness. <laughs> Voila! So there is the Pope on the St. Peter's balcony from the angle that I can use. You will ask, okay, so at that point you're ready to paint. Well, no. That is very good for giving me a general concept of what I'm going to do. But I, it's important that your lines be right and your angles be right. The only way you're going to do that is to get out paper and some rulers and do a perspective drawing. Um, I regret that this is the short version of the talk, and I can't talk more about that. Perspective drawing is one of my favorite subjects in life. It gives you all the answers to everything you could possibly want to know. Basically, this is what I did. And it involves line of the horizon, and then these angles that go to specific vanishing points. And when you have that, you can draw every element involved exactly the way it's supposed to be. Um, so I had, at that point, I had a very, some very big issues already solved. I had decided that I wanted to use the Easter motif, which you can see here. Easter Sunday is such a joyous time, and he was in such a radiant pose. I, I felt the two went together. I needed to decide something that you're going to think is trivial, but it's really not. I needed to decide the color I was going to make all the flowers on the balcony. He had officiated over two Easter Sunday ceremonies by then. And so I had photographs of the two. This was one, and this was the other with beautiful white roses. That is actually not a trivial decision because the things you paint into the picture are going to affect your color balance. Um, it's sort of like if you have two scales and you put a coin in one, it, it's going to change the relation of the two. And I had to think of it in terms of the color balance I already had, which was pretty poor. I was not happy with it. I had a, a, a lot of stone that was sort of a grayish beige, not a lot of color there. The Pope was wearing a white cassock, and the curtain on the French doors was also white. The only sort of color was going to be the burgundy grapes. So I thought, do I want to add more white here? No, I don't. I'm going to go with the pink. So at that point, basically, all the hard work was done. And the only thing left to do was just clean up the details, paint the picture. And so this is what I started with. And this is what I had about three weeks later. And this is the close-up of the face because in a portrait, um, the face is 
what really determines if it's successful or not. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your attention and your interest, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have.